Welcome back for more AP Biology. Today we're going to be dealing with DNA replication and the structure of DNA, which is in class broken up into two pieces, but here we're going to do it all as one big old massive piece. So we're going to look at how the structure of DNA tells us how it's going to re or how it's going to replicate. They actually care about the history of this, so I'm going to talk a little bit of history and some bits from your book. Jurassic Park actually kind of made people start paying attention to DNA when it came out in the 90s. And there's a clip that you can hunt down yourself, which is just the Mr. DNA part, but talks very briefly about what DNA is, at least to the lay person. It's, it's all right. So how do we know that DNA turns out to be the genetic information? The genetic information, or at least the DNA aspect of it, took several years to figure out. So the timeline was, we knew that Mendel said, hey, we don't just blend organisms together. They're actually little distinct units of things that we call genes and alleles that get inherited from parents and you get two copies. Thomas Hunt Morgan said, wait a second, actually it's not these gene things and Darwin is wrong. It turns out there are these little structures called chromosomes and that is actually what's causing the inheritance patterns. The chromosomes are made out of chromatin. Chromatin turns out to be protein and DNA. So which one is it? Is it DNA or is it protein? So that sparked a whole bunch of investigations, one of which was called the Griffith experiment, where he took a non-virulent, so a not deadly version of pneumonia, injected it into a mouse, mouse lives, take a deadly version, a virulent strain, kills the mouse. If I kill the virulent strain, so I boil it, inject it into the mouse, nothing happens. But he knows something strange, that if you were to take the dead virulent bacterium, and the living non-virulent form and mix them together, then inject it into the mouse. The result is dead mouse and you got the virulent strain back alive. He wasn't implying that there are zombie bacteria out there, but something made the non-virulent strain transform into a virulent strain. And we call that a transformation to this day. A follow-up series of experiments were conducted by a man by the name of Avery, and the results of his experiments said, DNA is the genetic information. No one paid attention or cared. So that sucked. A follow-up experiment to the Griffith experiment was performed by two individuals, Griffith, or Griffith, Hershey and Chase. Chase, by the way, was a woman. It's sometimes useful to know that women are part of this story. So when we look at what they did, what they examined were two parts. They tried to make it super simple. You had a bacterium, turned out to be E. coli, and a virus that attacks bacteria. It's called a bacteriophage. And there it just says phage. Bacteriophages have only two components, which is kind of simple. They have protein and they have DNA. So what they did was they made two different sets of solutions for the bacteriophages. They had bacteriophages that were growing in radioactive protein because sulfur is in protein. And they had phages that were growing in radioactive phosphorus because DNA has phosphorus. So you, they took the phages from these radioactive sources, one of them tagged in radioactive protein, one of them tagged with radioactive DNA, and they let them attack the bacteria. So bacteria get attacked, you let them have a chance to reproduce, and then what they did was they separated them out. So they split apart the cells from the viruses. How do you do that? With the centrifuge. So you just spin them around really fast. When you do that, they'll separate out big things with big things, small things with small things. And then all you had to do was test to see where was the genetic information? Where was the radioactivity? If the proteins turn out to be the genetic information, you should find the proteins the radioactive proteins associated with the bacteria. If you found the DNA associated with the bacteria, that means DNA was the thing that was being used for replication. That is, or for replication, that's for genetics. DNA would be the genetic information. So they looked and what they saw was they didn't find radioactive protein with the bacteria, but they found radioactive DNA. The result, DNA must be the genetic information. And that's that. That then begged the question, so what is DNA looking like? Through a whole series of events that I'm not going to recount here, 
these two individuals, James Watson on the left and Francis Crick on the right, took information from others and they built a model. That model turns out to be what we call the double helix. They actually didn't do any experimenting. They took others' information. In particular, they took this woman's information by the name of Rosalind Franklin. She was one of their competitors at a crosstown school there, both in England. And what she did was she did something called X-ray crystallography. X-ray crystallography is when you were to take an object and if you were to shine light on it, X-rays, the light scatters once it hits. So it'll hit and explode all over the place. What she does or did was she would take a picture of the light and how it scattered and then use that picture to reconstruct the original thing, the original object. The photo that you see there is called Photo 51, and it's the most, one of the most famous pictures ever taken of DNA. And that pattern there, she was analyzing it to figure out what it looks like. James Watson had a photographic memory. He saw a picture of it and said, oh, okay, took it over to Crick, quickly drew it for him. Francis Crick was one of those people who can, he knew a lot of different things. So he knew that, oh, that pattern there, if it's an X-ray diffraction pattern, that's a double helix. So they started working and eventually they figured out it was a double helix and they got the Nobel Prize. Rosalind Franklin's partner, who is Maurice Wilkins, also won the Nobel Prize. She did not because of her work with X-rays. She ended up dying from cancer and she didn't win the Nobel Prize, even though it was her work that won the Nobel Prize. Start argument. So when we look at the structure of DNA, what we notice is it's a double helix, meaning there's two sides to it, and the backbones are what we call a sugar phosphate backbone. The sugar of DNA is called deoxyribose, and the sugar of RNA is called ribose. Sounds very familiar to RUBP, or ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate, from photosynthesis. In the middle of this thing, we turn out to have bases. The bases are not based on nitrogen, so they're called nitrogenous bases. They're called cytosine, thymine, guanine, and adenine. The genius of Watson and Crick turned out to be twofold. He realized that these bases have to aim into the middle, and they pair up. In particular, adenine and thymine, so the blue and the red pair up. The yellow and the green, the cytosine and the guanine, also pair up. So we call those Watson Crick. Watson Crick base pairs. The additional thing that they noticed is in order to make the structure work, they had to have one side, one strand be upside down. We call that being anti parallel. When you look at the structure, you have to notice that there's a five prime and a three prime. So the five, then the little quote or the apostrophe is five prime, is the way it's read. Here's what this is interpreted as the sugar turns out to have a phosphate attached and then it has nothing underneath. The side of the sugar that has no phosphate attached is referred to as the 3' prime end, and the side of the sugar that has the phosphate is called the 5' prime end. When we look at this, the 5' prime end on the left side is paired up with the 3' prime end of the right side. The way that's interpreted is they are upside down to each other. One goes up and down, the other one goes down to up. The result of that is some strange pieces. One of the questions that then showed up was, well, how does DNA replicate? And there's several models of DNA replication. There is a semi-conservative model, meaning you're always going to be half old, half new. We had a conservative model, which is always either new or it's old, and you don't get any other option. And then we had what we call the dispersive model, which is some weird blend of all of them. A whole bunch of experiments were done in order to figure this out, and it turns out the semi-conservative model is the model that is used in DNA replication. So if you wanted to replicate your DNA, what do you need? Turns out you need three things. First thing that you're going to turn out to need is you need to happen to have an original replication, a starting point. The second thing you're going to need is we're going to need enzymes in order to actually replicate. We need parts or functioning parts to make this work. The third thing that you're going to need are brand new nucleotides. The way that we abbreviate nucleotides is we say DNTP for a dioxyribonucleic trinucleotide phosphate, which sounds shockingly like ATP from before. But basically all that turns out to be is it's an ATP missing an oxygen, hence deoxy. Or it's a TTP missing an oxygen, hence 
di or deoxythymine triphosphate, or it should be thymoside triphosphate. So we have to have the parts for the replication. We need something to put them together, and we need to have a place to start. What this turns out to do is we get what we call a replication fork. Step first thing that we're going to do is we need to open up the DNA, and then we need to add starting points. In order for DNA to replicate, we need to have a free three prime end. This end here, this three prime end here, that is what needs to be exposed. If I don't have a three prime end exposed, I can't replicate. DNA always needs to have a three prime end. RNA, it turns out, does not. RNA and DNA can't add to the five prime end, but they always can add to the three prime end. DNA needs a three prime end. RNA can start from scratch. So what do we do? We add down a bit of a primer. The enzyme that would add a primer is called primase. So it's a primer enzyme. How do we say enzyme? We say ace. So it's a primer ace primase. So if, as long as I have a free three prime end exposed, which is this top strand, I can just keep on replicating. I can keep adding more nucleotides on. The enzyme that we use to add brand new nucleotides to make a brand new DNA polymer is called the DNA polymer ACE or DNA polymerase. You do need to know the enzyme names, unfortunately. So that that's easy. We can just keep on going. The problem then shows up, well, what do you do with the other side? Because this other side of the DNA, when we open this thing up, it's not going to have a three prime end exposed towards this fork. It's going to actually have a five prime end. Well, I, I don't know how to replicate that. So we have a solution. How did we get this thing started? We opened up the DNA, then we added a primer. Well, why can't we add primers again using primase? So if we add another primer, the result is I get a three prime end, and now DNA polymerase can fill in the gaps. Add primer, DNA polymerase can fill in the gaps. The catch that we now run into is, but what do we do about the primer there? Because now that's made out of RNA. Turns out there are many forms of DNA polymerase, and some forms of DNA polymerase can rip that little red piece, that primer, off, and we will backfill. So we'll fill in the gap, remove the primer, add in DNA, life is good. It leaves a little itty bitty problem at the very end where I'm going to have an existing five prime end and I add a brand new piece of DNA with a three prime end here. The catch is I can only attach this way. I can three prime end, then attach that to a five prime end. If I have a five prime end and I, then I dropped in a three prime end, these things don't know how to connect. So we have one additional enzyme called ligase, which is there to ligate. Ligate means glue together. In order to keep this thing going, we need something to unzip the helix or the double helix, and that's referred to as helicase. Seems to make sense. It's the enzyme that deals with the helix. In bacteria, you just keep doing that until you have gone all the way around. You could actually sit there and draw it out yourself. It's relatively simple. If we look at a eukaryotic organism, slightly different story. We need, because we have so much more DNA, we need to have multiple origins of replication, and the result is we get a whole bunch of bubbles, what we call replication bubbles, which each end of the bubble is a replication fork, until eventually we get extra DNA. We have one particular problem, and that will turn out to be at the ends of our DNA, the ends of our DNA, eukaryotic organisms. It turns out, because we have chromosomes, and the chromosomes are linear, not circular, there's an end to these. And those end pieces, every time we replicate, because of this problem of the five prime, three prime end, and we can only add to a three prime end, is the ends, the end pieces, what we call the telomeres, or the end pieces, or the far away pieces, shorten every time we replicate our DNA. And that might have some trouble. So there are consequences to DNA replication, and there turn out to be consequences to being able to fix that problem. The place where we can fix that problem are in gamete forming cells, where we need to constantly have brand new, fresh, un 
adulterated DNA in cancer. This is the functioning of telomerase or the enzyme that acts on the telomer, which is just this red piece that hops on in. And what it does is it allows for a free three prime end so we can fill in the gap. That's all you happen to do. Where do you find this? Again, we find it in gamete forming cells and we find it in cancer.